Welcome to the Micronaut and Alexa talk. We're going to talk about using Alexa. How many of you have Alexas in your home? It's not too many. A few. Yeah? Well, if nothing else, you can also learn about lambdas, because we're using lambdas to deploy Alexa skills. So, two things you can get out of it. All right. Uh, my name is Ryan Vanderwerf. I'm a software engineer in the Grails Micronaut team at Object Computing. Um, father of two kiddos. I tinker with gadgets like these. I also do the Google Home stuff um, as well. We don't have support yet for that in Micronaut. Um, but if you need any help about Groovy Grails or Micronaut stuff, be sure to hit me or any of my team members up. A little bit about OCI. All right, so what are we going to talk about? Uh, what is Alexa? What devices does it cover? We're going to talk about how does it work in general, so you kind of understand the concept of it and where things are running. Uh, evolution of UI, how we got there. Uh, Alexa software concepts and components. There's a V2 API that Micronaut's using versus, um, if you've seen my Grails talk before, it's using V1 API. Talk about lambdas and a little overview of lambdas and how we set that up in our Micronaut app. And we've got some examples. And we've got a Star Wars quiz, which is, uh, if you saw the, if anyone's played the Star Wars quiz out on our table out there, uh, I'll show you the guts of that and how it works. All right, so what is Alexa? Uh, Alexa is basically a cloud-based voice recognition service. And the architecture is pretty simple. We've just got uh, a question, it goes to the Alexa service, and then a response comes back. And then there's also something called a card that we send back, and that goes to the application. So if you go to echo amazon.com or you have the app on your phone, you can have a card that would have different data than maybe what it speaks, i.e. maybe a URL or something, right? You wouldn't want it to say URL, that would be really annoying, but uh, you'd want the card to say that. So there's two different pieces of data that you send back. Uh, here's some of the devices. So there have been three generations now of Echoes. This is uh, the newest one. These are the older one. These are version three, actually, and that's two. Uh, basic things Alexa can do, uh, you know, you can ask if it'll rain tomorrow, if it knows your location, it'll give you the weather, w Wikipedia, things like that. Uh, the Echo Show that we have out there, uh, you can do some videos on it. It used to have YouTube support, but Google pulled that support out and it caused a little bit of a war between Google and Amazon that's starting to get resolved. This is what the guts of it are, so basically what all these things are is really just being uh, enough to record your voice and upload it to the Alexa service on Amazon. It doesn't actually keep any kind of recordings really in, in a, any kind of long-term space on the device itself. So it's kind of a, just a, what you call it, like a bent pipe. It's sending everything back. It only knows enough to be able to respond to the wake word and then upload. You know, this is what the guts of the original one looks like with the speakers. That one had a subwoofer and all that fun stuff. Uh, what makes it useful, though, is the microphones on the top have a seven microphone array right here. So basically, when you start talking, it will figure out which one's picking up the best signal and then shut off all the other microphones. And that's what makes it better than just setting your phone on your counter, right, and then using a speech service is that it can direct things properly. Uh, the Echo V1, that's basically the first one there, was a picture of that. Then they came out with the Echo Dot. So the, uh, this was the original one, or technically this is a V2. V1 was very limited supply that they only made a very few of them and sent them out. And this is the current one, which sounds much better. It looks nicer. It's got that bit of fabric, kind of like the Google one has. Uh, what's cool about all these is they have an audio um, jack to go to, like a home stereo or something. And they're cheap, very cheap. That's what it looks like on the inside. And we've got a tap. There's a battery-powered one you can carry around. Uh, it used to have to push the button. That's why they called it tap, for it to listen to you. But now uh, they had a firmware update. You can leave it on all the time, but the battery will run out eventually after about a day. So that one is basically like a portable Bluetooth speaker. Uh, they got one called the Look. Uh, I actually picked one of these up the other day. They were, they were blowing them out for like 27 bucks or something. Uh, normally, they were, when they first came out, they were $200, but basically it will give you fashion advice, so you can take a picture and it will come back and say whether uh, they think you look fat, I guess, so, you know, 
if your wife uh, says, do I look fat in this or something, you could say, oh, I don't know, talk to that one. Anyway, that way you're not getting any kind of wrath. <laughs> but you can also use it to just record pictures and videos So on the commands. So you can say, take a video recording and save it, and then you can use it for that, which is kind of cool. So if you can pick one up for like dirt cheap on closeout, it's actually good for that. I wouldn't pay 200 bucks for one, but a quarter of that price, or less than a quarter of that price, yeah, it's cool. Uh, I don't know if... Fire TVs, I know they sell, sell those here and they've sold them for a while. Uh, those have all the same Alexa functionalities except for uh, the alarm function. It doesn't work on the Fire TV, I don't know why. I guess they figure you wouldn't, your TV would have to be on for it to uh, wake you up or whatever. Yep, so all the same stuff works. And that's what's cool is when you make one of these skills and you upload it, it's going to work on all your devices associated to your Amazon account. So it doesn't matter whether it's a Fire TV or you've got Echo devices around your house, it's all going to work and you be on the same account. So, And what's nice is that because they're all on the same account, um, you don't have to even launch them publicly for them to be available to yourself. And if you want to share it with a friend, you can do a beta function I'll show you. You can share that function and have someone else's email be able to access your skills without having to go through and pass the publication process. All right, that's Fire TV. This is the Echo Show. I've got the old version of it outside there. There's a new one that looks a little bit sleeker. It's got a little bit bigger screen. But uh, this one I'll show you a little bit about. So now you've got not only speech things that come back, but you've got layouts and markup. So you can have... Uh, if you noticed on the Star Wars thing out there, I've got a Star Wars picture background. It looks like of the Millennium Falcon kind of warping. So you can have layouts and have uh, pre-configured things in different spots and have a picture or text in each spot, or there's layouts for lists and things like that. And I'll show you how to do that in the code. That's what's cool about doing all of that. You kind of get that extra um, bit there. So it does add some complication. Uh, the spot, I have this as my alarm clock at home. Uh, it's also got a screen, but it's much tinier. And the sound quality isn't very awesome in it, but it, it works good for an alarm clock. And then the last one we talk about here is the Echo Input. It has no speaker whatsoever on it. It's just the microphones. And you can get those for like under $20. So if you ha want to use your home stereo for everything, you can just plug this in as an input, and then um, it'll always sound good. Uh, we also have gadgets. That's one of the next things that I want to uh, work on here, and there's support for it in the API. So you can do gadgets. One of them is these light-up buttons. So you buy them in pairs of two, and you can have up to six. And they use Bluetooth to pair to your uh, Amazon device. And there's an API for using the, uh, talking to these things via, uh, use it via Bluetooth protocol. And another one is this alarm clock, which is kind of cool. I have one of these in my kitchen. So it, it, it does one uh, tick for each minute left. So it'll count down and then start flashing when your timer's done. So I use that for cooking. You can have more than one going on simultaneously. Uh, the other gadgets, though, you can use Simon Says. There's other stuff like um, there's the, a microwave that is a gadget, technically. It doesn't have an Alexa in it, and it's only like $70. And, but you can say, Alexa, make popcorn, and the microwave will come on and make popcorn. Pretty neat. Uh, there's a Big Mouth Billy Bass, they actually produced this. Some guy, one guy made it as a kind of a joke, and I guess they thought about doing it. There's a dancing robot uh, and cr uh, Christmas lights I've seen. Anyway, so you can access all that stuff from your skill. All right, then there's other ones. Do Google Home, and, uh, Facebook Portal's another one, Apple HomePod, one called Ling Ling Ding Dong, which is for the Chinese market. Um, so this all kinds of things. You can make your own if you want. There's a uh, DIY here. You can just get a Raspberry Pi and a microphone and then follow this guide here. It's fairly involved, so I'm not going to go over it in this talk. That would be a whole talk in itself. Uh, but you can make your own if you don't trust whatever hardware they give you is nefarious. You can try it all out for yourself. All right, so let's get back to the Alexa skills. How do they work? So uh, you, you as an application developer are never ever talking to their device directly, right? We're talking, the device talks to the Alexa service on AWS, and then uh, you're talking to AWS directly. And then it's passing that request back through things called intents, and I'll show you what those look like. And when it figures out what intent you mean when you talk to it, it tells it what code to invoke to generate a response and parse the input. And it's all, it's all done with JSON. Technically, you could do this manually yourself, 
by just using Jackson and parsing and reforming the JSON and putting it back, but they've got a nice API, so you might as well just use that, and it'll do all the hard work for you, because it gets kind of, kind of crazy with all these nested lists of things. And you can do text-to-speech, small sound clips, video, music, sound, all these things are supported now. Uh, right now, you can only run this as a Lambda function with Micronaut. So uh, we don't have support yet if you want to just run Micronaut as a standalone web server and then have a controller respond to Alexa. Uh, we don't have that worked out yet, but that's something that is going to get added later. All right, so here's a little more detail about how it works. So we can see here we've got, uh, when we talk to the Alexa service, uh, it, go, it parses the responses from our app back through again, and then the cards go through here. And the developer portal is where we set up all the metadata for our skill. So our code's deployed as a developer app, which could be on, in, for Micronaut, that would be in Lambda. And then the portal will define all, everything about how to talk to our application. So there's kind of two pieces you need to deploy to make it work. I'll talk briefly about this. I don't want to spend too much time on this, but UIs have kind of evolved over the years, right? We went from character-based graphics to GUIs to web interfaces to mobile interfaces, and now we're at voice user interfaces. And this has been a lot more inclusive of people that aren't very tech savvy, right? People can talk to something, uh, especially my, people like my parents that are older. Uh, they're more comfortable trying to talk to something than they are trying to pull up a screen and get in, involved in a big mess of web pages or fancy mobile app. Uh, they're just more likely to do that. So I have something, if my mom falls, she can just yell out, you know, uh, Alexa, call Ryan, and then call for help that way. And you can just place these around the house. So it's really evolved into being more inclusive for people. Maybe you have a disability or something like that. Turning the light, simple things like turning the lights on and off or turning the TV on and off are all things that make people's lives better. And it's why this stuff matters. You know, we go back to our old green screens right, from the 70s, and then we go to the first, like, Apple interface here with a GUI. We can have layers of information, drag things around, move things, and we go to our old web page, a mosaic. How many people are here used to use mosaic? Ever been around long enough? Yeah, good. And then we got to the mobile interfaces where we could do things like, you know, pinch and zoom and angry birds flipping things, stretch, you know, new interactions and gestures. So now we've got to evolve to voice user interfaces. It's not all the same, right? So we've got to follow certain rules of how to um, prompt someone, right? When you say you have your application ask for an action for them to say something, you kind of need to guide them to tell them what. So you've got to follow some best practices on how to do that. All right, so the SDKs. So there's actually several SDKs available. We're going to talk about the custom skills SDK today. Uh, there's flash briefings, which are basically RSS feeds that you can feed. So you can say, Alexa, give me my briefing in the morning, and you can have your favorite news feeds plugged in there, and it'll basically read you the news, tell you the weather or whatnot. Uh, you can make your own, and then it's basically just pointing to RSS feeds. Uh, there's Smart Home SDK, which is specifically for um, home automation types of tasks. That has to be run as a Lambda. Uh, on their system. Uh, and then there's a music and video SDK that's just specific for those things. And there's also a new one called Baby Activity. So you can make a skill just for baby activities. I haven't tried it yet. But. And then there's the voice SDK, which is what you would run in like the Raspberry Pi where you're providing your own hardware or you say you want to make your own Alexa device. You can use the voice SDK as the, uh, your test bed to test all that stuff out before you would actually build the hardware and deploy it. So we'll talk about the skills one for the rest of the time here. Again, we uh, host this as a Lambda function, and we parse the JSON request. You know, it's always initiated by the user. There's very few exceptions to that. Um, one exception is uh, an alarm function, where you say, set an alarm for 3 o'clock, uh, or add something to my calendar. Or the other exception is that you have uh, echo device to device calling. So you can say either um, drop in, you say Alexa drop in on whatever name you have. So my kids, I have Alexa devices for their names. So I can say drop in on Caleb, and then I can yell at him to go take out the garbage or something. Or I'll have an, uh, the other exception to that is an announcement. We can just say Alexa send an announcement. It'll just broadcast to all the devices in your house that will you say something like dinner's ready. So you don't have to go around yelling for kids to come downstairs. 
So those are the only exceptions where something could happen that you didn't initiate. Everything else, especially in the SDK, you can't really bypass that. It has to be, you know, you're called and you respond. Uh, we're using version two of the SDK, so they basically rewrote it. They had an initial version of the SDK, it was really simple, and if you've seen Mike Rails talk, um, a lot, I know, apologize, these, a lot of these slides were the same at the beginning, but um, it didn't, they didn't really plan on how it grew to all these different kinds of devices and all these things, and then it became like very difficult to do fancy things. So they redid the whole SDK in a completely different way, and that's what the uh, Micronaut stuff's using. All right, what does the SDK do for us? I mean, it does things like validate the request, so it'll make sure that uh, when you get a request to your Lambda function, that it's actually someone legitimate calling you from a Echo device, not just some random robot on the internet. So it can validate the request with a ha encrypted hash value uh, and tell where it's coming from, and then it'll handle all that stuff for you. And it also has to pass the right application ID in, which is uh, something we'll set up in the develop developer portal. Uh, it, gives, it gives us decent user interface for all these things. And uh, my example will probably show you quite a bit. All right, so let's dig into the specifics. Um, so what you do on the developer portal is you're describing intents, which are actions. Think of those like an action. And then we've got slots, and those are like parameters, right? So if I need an input, like, hello, Ryan, well, a slot would be a name then. And then so um, that's how I would know to parameterize things. So when I create my sample utterances, I can put parameters in there, and I'll show you soon. All right, so let's take a look at what, what that looks like. Actually, let's look at the developer portal. All right, so here's my, um, here's a simple hello world. So what we've got here is an invocation word, starts it off, that's what tells it to say, Alexa, open hello world Micronaut, is what this example is. This is one of those that ships with the uh, Micronaut uh, AWS SDK. And we create intents, and that's gonna tell us what to do. So if I say, um, what am I gonna respond to? So if I say hello, it's going to execute this path here on our sample utterance of hello. And then at that point, I can create slots here, and I can put in a value of, like, it could echo back a name or something. Uh, and for example, one of these questions here is, what is your favorite programming language? So now I'm going to create a slot uh, here. Here's, here. here's the actual slot that says, OK, it's this custom slot type of favorite programming language. And then I can choose what those values are here. Uh, back here, they always change this thing around. Oh, so here, custom slot types, it'll appear here. So I put a bunch of different programming languages in here. So what's going to happen is we're going to say, what's your favorite programming language? You're going to say one of these things, and it's going to say, cool, I like whatever that is too, back. And uh, sample utterances are now a part of these things here. So here's the slot parameter, right? It says, I like, is the response it makes, your f whatever your favorite programming language is. And will say, I like that too. And you can even add an extra level called intent confirmation where you say, do you acknowledge that you heard this or something like that? Maybe it's going to do some action that's not reversible, um, like, calling 911 or something maybe, or calling for emergency service. Um, you can say, are you sure you want to do that? So you can add that as an intent confirmation at the end. That's something that's new. All right. And so we can even um, import these. called interaction model, I can, cut and I can import and export these. It used to be you had to cut and paste different bits of stuff in. Now it creates one big document that describes your entire skill. So this is the Star Wars one. These are all the intents it supports. And samples are uh, sample utterances right here with a slot in it. So it'll understand 
you can respond to it in this way, right? You can say the number. You can say the number is my answer. You can say, is it some number as a question? And it'll take that as a response. Um, I don't know, don't know, no clue, uh, or all the other things that would basically s repeat the question again, right? So we have a regular intent up here for answer. And then we've got our things here. And list of answers is literally a custom type that's just one through four. That's all it is. And that list doesn't have to be complete. Don't think of it as a thing that's, it can only pick one of those things. It's actually just guiding it. So it'll take other answers that are similar sounding to your uh, list of things. You can, for example, you could have a, a, there's a slot type called name, and it takes common names of people. And they've already trained it for like every name that Amazon's ever heard of and put that in the list. So it doesn't have to be complete. All right, slots, we talked a little bit about that. So the slot is the parameter for how you, you know, parameterize input when you use your ask the user something. Slots don't work really well, though, for variable or parameter responses. So initially, when we made the first person of this game, we actually asked and made it multiplayer and said, what's your uh, name of each player? And it was a four-player game. And what ended up happening was um, if you had if you set a number for someone's name, it would get confused and crash. And there's basically no way around that. Um, and that's how we called Baruch uh, on, uh, from JFrog. It calls him Bottles. So that's, what, that's our nickname for him now. We call him Bottles because Alexa said it, said it was. He said, what's your name? Baruch. And it said, I heard Bottles. All right. There you go. There's a list here. Um, URL of all the different slot types that are defined, um, it's growing every day. There's just tons of them for all kinds of common things you would think of. So you don't need to build your own lists of every single thing out there. It's got even like types of movies or just all kinds of stuff. All right, sample utterances. That was those little strings, right, that I showed you here where it says uh, these under samples in this JSON here. This, is, this was generated, by the way. I didn't have to type all this in by hand uh, from the UI. But that trains it. So the more examples you give it of, of data and samples, the better it understands you. It doesn't have to be complete. If you get a list of all kinds of things, even misspelled words to help with phonetics of the way people talk, uh, you can do that. And the more you give it, the better chance it will have of understanding. And it, because it's an AI type of thing, you don't have to be exact. You can give it. The more possibilities, though, the more likely it is to guess what you're doing, especially if it's like names of things that aren't words, right? That can be kind of tricky, like Grails or, you know, Micronaut or things like that. All right, so every time you do this and you change it in the developer console, what's going to happen is I have to rebuild the model. So if I make any sort of change to this at all, what's going to happen is it's going to say build model. And this basically is compiling all those iterations of your samples, and it generates other ones too for built-in things, and it's going to say build started. And if it doesn't work or there's something invalid with your syntax, it'll tell you here. So right now, no one can use the skill while it's building. And that's the other half of it. The other half is the Lambda that we'll deploy. I'll let that bake. All right, the other way to get to this and use it is the Alexa app. That's how we see those card responses. And if your uh, uh, Alexa ever goes off erroneously, and you, you think it's spying on you, just go into the app here and look and see what it thought you said. Because it probably misheard something you said and triggered it accidentally. And you can actually report all those false positives, and it'll make the system better. So it won't uh, keep doing that. And then you can see all the cards, things like that. You can at least install skills. Uh, on your, for your account uh, through the application. So there's a directory of skills. You can even buy them. You can subscribe to them. So there's actually an avenue where you could do this and make money. It used to not be the case, but now you can. So um, you never know. You could make a cool application. If it becomes one of the top applications that are used on Alexa, Amazon will just start sending you checks. I know one guy that made a little kid's game. He got a check for like $1,500 or something like that because it, was, it became a popular one. It was just some simple game. It wasn't anything 
really crazy. Cards. Again, these are the, uh, this is the concept of a card that comes back to the phone. So you'll see a white square, um, and you can do that. And there's three different kinds of cards you can do. You can't include HTML or JavaScript in a card uh, just because they're worried about you doing something malicious with it. So there's pretty much a simple text-only response card, a uh, standard with a picture, or there's a type of card called link account. And I'll talk a little bit more about account linking uh, a little bit later. All right, so intents. This is how we, um, I showed you that in the developer app. So let's take a look about, let's look at Micronaut app here and take a look at the code and how we use intents. There's a special annotation we use. This one's groovy, but you can make them in Java or Kotlin. All of these are supported. So I can make handlers and I can make a class just for an intent. Come on. All right, there we go. So we can do that by implementing a request handler. And then um, we basically implement two methods, can handle, and it'll tell you whether it's basically the right one or not to do checking, and then handle. And then basically this handler input can be turned into this thing called a request envelope where you can get session data of a map passed back and forth for temporary purposes, kind of like a HTTP session. Uh, you can't put a lot of big things in it though because it is an actual JSON map being passed back and forth. Uh, if you need anything bigger, then you need to use some sort of secondary storage like DynamoDB or a database or something, something else. And this actually uses DynamoDB. Uh, we're doing some of uh, the display stuff here. So uh, in, th in this example, I've uh, separated everything out to this display service bean in Micronaut that will say whether or not it's a th something that supports displays. And if it does, it'll start trying to bold things, format the text a little bit better. Um, otherwise, it'll just do this straight string of these characters. So we can improve this, right? We could add more stuff to it. Uh, here we create a question from MetaNOVDB and all that, blah, blah. And then here's at the end, really, what happens is you build this response back up. And this is a big difference to the V2 API. It's basically all builders. So we say, get response builder, and then we say, with this speech, and we give it some text, and then we say, with this card, and then a render template if it supports displays, uh, whether or not we want to prompt for a response, or it's just going to say something and then exit, which is what, you know, reprompt kind of thing can do. And that's, and that's it. And so, uh, by default, though, when you make a Micronaut application here, what's going to happen is you're just going to make something uh, like a class called Alexa application, and we can add our intents in here. If you want to make it just, if it's something really small and you just want to put it all in one class, you can do that by using this at intent handler uh, command here. And so there's some built-in ones here. That say if, so if you say help, uh, it can do a fallback, basically. If the user asks for something and it's like, I don't have an intent for this, what do I do? You can make it call your fallback handler and it'll say, sorry, I don't know that. That way, um, if they just, if it didn't understand them or some kind of gibberish, you can at least prompt them and says, try again. Uh, or you can use cancel and stop. And all these things are required. So if you want to publish a skill, if you don't implement help, cancel, stop, all those basic things, they'll immediately reject your application. And it takes like three to five days each run you submit it because a person actually goes and checks the skill and makes sure that it's legit and that it doesn't violate any copyrights or standards and all those things. So best to do all that stuff up front and handle it. Otherwise, it'll just slow down your process. Uh, and here we've got here an answer intent. So this is when they answer a question. So we just say at intent handler. And then this has to match your intent that you've got over here in the developer console, right? Under here, under intents. So you got to make sure these match. And you do need to implement Amazon fallback intent on the developer console here or the um, Micronaut won't be able to handle passing that back to you as I didn't understand what you were doing. And you say repeat question, that's another required one. If it ever, you ever miss what it says, you're supposed to always be able to say, can you repeat this? Uh, or repeat it needs to be supported. And so that's pretty much it. And then I've got a, some boilerplate code here that basically says if they're using a display, use this builder. If not, use this builder, which basically just does the template stuff for the uh, Echo Show or the dot and all of that. And if we look in here, 
Uh, let me show you that real quick. So it's not identified by device type. It's de defined by what capabilities something has. So you can't really know if they have an Echo Show or an Echo Spot. Uh, all you can know is that it's a display service and it supports certain things. And we've got some other stuff here, making text, making rich text, which we can have bold and fonts and things like that in here. And so this basically will figure out whether or not you can do that. And then we s kind of save that so we don't have to keep going through this again and again. All right, let's get back to the slides. All right, so I showed you two different classes, and that's it. And that's pretty much all you need to do for Micronaut to do an Oxyscale. It's pretty makes it pretty dead simple. Uh, probably the more confusing part is just using that developer console. All right. Uh, we can also do things like uh, playing audio. So there's a skill, I think it still works, I haven't tried it lately. There's a groovy podcast skill that I did a while back. That's actually running just straight groovy and uh, Lambda by itself. But um, you can do these audio player directives that will start, stop, and play music. And to get that published, I actually had to pass a test to where you can stop the playback at any moment and say pause. And that means you have to store the session state somewhere else. You can't use the temporary session map. So I put the state of where they were at their request ID into a DynamoDB table. And then you can come back an hour later and say, I'd like to resume. And then it's going to play that same audio back. And you have to support that. So it'll pull that out of the DynamoDB. It says exactly what offset they were at or what time marker. And then you can play it back. So you can do that specifically in these skills. Uh, you can't mix and match. Though, it's like if you're going to make a request, it's going to respond with a long term audio. You can't mix like interacting with it at that point because it's kind of busy and tied up. That's one thing to keep in mind. Uh, if you want to just have audio snippets play uh, intersp interspersed with your response and text, you can do that with SSML. And I'll talk about that a little bit where you can put little MP3 bits with a certain kind of markup and then it'll like say a certain sound or play a little tune uh, at the beginning of things. And you see that used a lot in Alexa games for kids, just to make it more engaging. Uh, and these are basically certain directives that happen that when you return the response. You can say, uh, cue something up like a playlist, so if you're adding music to a list. Or you can say, just wipe out everything and only play my thing. Um, or you could say, uh, what it, replace whatever has currently been queued up. So all you do is tack on that builder. You just say, add audio player directive, and then it will do that. All right, so here we'll talk about SSML. So that's cool. It can talk, right? But sometimes the talking is awkward. It maybe doesn't pronounce a word correctly, or um, it doesn't have the right inflection, right, on certain kinds of things. So SSML basically fixes that. And this is kind of a standard that's being used by Google Home's system as well, and I suspect the Apple one does the same. Um, but we can do that to also play these sound bits. And so the only limitation is you can only do maximum of 90 seconds, 48 kilobit, SSL hosted MP3s is the only for or format it supports. So it's, this is definitely not high fidelity kind of stuff. It's like telephone grade stuff. Uh, you wouldn't want your playlist for music to go through this. Uh, you can also do other commands like pronouncing certain words. They actually have SSML markup for common phrases like good morning or good evening in every language possible. And so you can just use that markup and then whatever language they're running on their Echo device, it will say it in that language, perfectly pre-recorded, basically. So right, it won't sound robotic or awkward. And we've got a whole reference of SSML. There's like thousands of commands for this. And all you have to do is when you response text, you can mix SSML in. You just add the markup into the text. And then when Alexa hits that markup, it's going to then parse and interpret it. That's, so that's all you have to do. And if you want to have audio and video player support specifically for those special kind of skills that only do that, uh, here's some help of links for you you can go to uh, to get started on that. It all should still work within Micronaut. Uh, here's a magic command to make MP3s work with the uh, Alexa skill and SSML. So if you can run this on a Linux machine or even a Mac, run FFmpeg with these, these parameters, I figured out exactly what works is what you want to use those, and then you're good to go. Uh, one thing to remember is those MP3s need to be hosted with a valid SSL certificate. 
It can't be an invalid certificate. Alexa, Amazon won't trust it and won't play it. Because remember, it's telling their device to go to these links and play them, right? So if you have some sketchy SSL certificate, it's, they, they block all of that stuff. Um, there is one caveat, though. You can use a self-signed cert in development mode only. And the common name needs to match the host name your skill's running at. That's the only exception. So here's an SSML, what it would look like for playing music. So you can actually go to S3 and pull this up off of my account, and it'll play some goofy thing in there. I don't remember what it is, but uh, that's, what it that's what your markup would look like. Or here's how to weigh, you can say speaking numbers, for example. Um, speak each digit separately, make it a cardinal number or not. Uh, spell out a word. Like, so if you say spell out, right, hello, it's going to say H-E-L-L-O. So that's how you make it do those kinds of different types of conversations. Um, testing options, so there's a lot here. You can um, do developer.amazon.com test tab, which is used to be really kind of crummy, and it's actually pretty good now. So if I want to go here, here, let's go to the, you don't even need a device at all anymore. It's gotten good enough to where you really don't need it. Here, let's take a look at this one. This is the one running out there. So if I go to the test tab, so I can I type what I would say. So I can say open Micronaut Star Wars quiz. Come on. Welcome to the unofficial Star Wars quiz. I'm going to ask you five questions to test your Star Wars knowledge. All right, let's shut that up. But uh, you can play with that outside there. But here's what happens, right? Here's all the JSON coming in that we get from Amazon that our SDK will parse for you, or Amazon's SDK plus Micronaut handles all this stuff for you. But this is what it all looks like. You can see it. And then here's what's being spat out by Micronaut right here. So I've got my question, my possible answers, all of those things. And then I'm passing some session data here, right? This is the map of stuff that I can keep for temporary state. Um, I can, I'm basically storing in the session what was the last question I asked, so I don't ask the same question twice. Um, and whether or not I support display, so I don't have to make that check each time. And then... Um, you know, what was the question that I'm actually dealing with right here? And then see, I've got my speech text, which is the part Alexa's going to say. And then we've got our card text, which will appear in the card on Amazon. And then um, this is an index of the DynamoDB table where the question's at uh, to help it randomly pick one. And then this is the answer they, they said. All right, you can also use echosim.io, which is another browser-based thing. Uh, it'll act like an echo. This one's been around for a while. Uh, basically, you can log in with your Amazon account here and then access your skills and test them here. But it'll, it just has this picture of it, and it'll talk. So this was something that a community person made, just like anyone like you or I made this. And uh, it was so good that uh, Amazon adopted it as their like, official thing for a while uh, because the testing console used to be kind of bad. But as you can see, this is pretty good. And even down below, see, look, it even says what it, I can even test out what it looks like. So this is exactly what's appearing on the Echo Show out there, right? This is from the same source. Uh, which interesting is this is animated here, and on the Echo Show, it's not animating. So it doesn't really support an animated uh, image. But this would leave you to believe it does. <laughs> Another gotcha. All right, so we've got some example stuff here. So if we go into latest Micronaut 1.1 one, one or higher, uh, we can go in here to uh, the AWS module. So this is under Micronaut projects on GitHub. 
do tool window project. All right, so we've got example applications here in the Micronaut AWS module. So this is all, anything to do with Amazon's in here. So we've got example stuff under here under examples. And we've got one for straight Java. And these are basic, these are really basic hello world. But it's got enough in here um, to push the Lambda to um, Amazon. So all we need to do to deploy this, uh, let's see. Let's go back here. So all we need to do if we're using Gradle, you can use Gradle or Maven because we support both in Micronaut. Where did my Gradle go? I don't do that. Ah. I opened my project wrong. Um, what we can do here is the, uh, in our terminal, okay, Alexa, it's using the, um, plug-in for Gradle that will automatically deploy your Lambda. So um, I can just run deploy here, and it's going to use my credentials that I have in my environment settings. So as long as you have your .aws folder set up in your home directory and it has the credentials in it and the default account it's going to use, uh, it'll basically automatically deploy this to Lambda for you. So right now it's deploying this to Amazon and building the jar. And because it's so much smaller in Micronaut, look, look how quickly it can, it can do all of that. And so now I can go in here to the Amazon console, and I can go to Lambda. Let me think of this. Hello. Hello world, Alexa, Java, I think. Yeah, here we go. This one redeployed 19 seconds ago. So that's much faster. When we were doing this with Grails and things like that, it was the jar file was pushing the limit of 64 megabytes. It was the limit of how big a jar can be for Lambda. We're nowhere near that now with Micronaut because it's so tight, so inefficient, and so quick. Uh, so here, all you need to do is when you do uh, a new application, you need to make sure you add this trigger here, and it's going to warn you. If you don't have a trigger set for Alexa skills kit, it's not going to know to talk to Alexa service. That's how we tell the Lambda to interact with the skill. So when we do that, and here, we have to configure um, our skill ID right here. So it tells you, oh, to get this, go to the developer portal. So if I go here, it'll tell me my skill ID. See, this is the skill ID. And that's also protection, right? So if you get a request from something and they talk in, talking to your Lambda function, it's going to check to see if the incoming skill ID matches this, as well as checking a hash value um, to make sure it's legitimate. And we've also got examples here for, um, we've got Java, right? We just deployed that one. We've got, We've got a Kotlin example here, so um, not that a lot of people here are all that interested from it, but um, pretty much all the same stuff works here. We just have funds instead of um, methods. All right, here's, if you want to do the visual display stuff, so you'll see this screenshot here. Uh, this is in the developer portal. You have to actually turn these on, these little sliders. If you don't activate these, your display stuff won't be there, and it won't, it'll just ignore any kind of markup you're sending it about doing display stuff. So you have to actually turn that on. Uh, you can also turn on gadget support and all these other things. So 
Um, I'm not sure why they're all disabled by default because I don't think it breaks anything if you just turn them on. Um, I don't know. Maybe it takes more memory on their end for things. Uh, so doing visual stuff, here's a little bit of templates, right? So uh, we use a template when we want to do visual things. Uh, th there's different preset templates you can do. Uh, but there's body template one that looks like this. There's body template two, which is a little bit fancier. We've got some headings and a picture and you know a little try this thing on the bottom of it. Uh, and then we've got uh, template three, just it's on the left, not quite as fancy. Um, and there's six and seven, I don't have examples of those. There's also things called list templates. So if you want to show visually a list of items and you can let people like touch it if it supports touch screen, you can give them choices here. So um, I could make this uh, skill better for the Star Wars quiz by using a list template and then showing these in a nicer order and it would look better. And then I can do the same thing with having an image for each choice as well. And that's all you have to do here. Build a body template. You can give it a background image, a title, title text, and all of that stuff. All right. We showed you the Star Wars quiz. Uh, publishing it, so if you want to publish things, um, we can, uh, you, certain requirements have to be met. You have to do a 108 by 108 um, type of thing uh, for an image, and we have to have a large image as well. So if you don't have those, you can't even complete the publishing process. Uh, you have to have a valid recognized cert if you're not hosting it on Lambda. You have to have a valid privacy policy for your skill. Uh, you have to have proper help. You have to support stop, cancel. Uh, you, you have to be really careful about this. They're really picky. You have to make sure it doesn't violate anyone's trademark or anything. The, you can get around that by saying something is unofficial. Like I did Star Wars quiz there, and I said unofficial Star Wars quiz. Uh, you can get away with it by doing things like that, but sometimes they'll still reject it. To do the Groovy podcast skill, I actually had to have Ken Cousin send a letter to Amazon saying that I was authorized to use that because they thought Podbean, who's their, one of the podcast places they published to, owned the content, they, which they don't. But I had to have a letter to tell them that. And the only way I could get them the letter was to put it in an S3 bucket and give them a URL because there's no way to send an attachment even. <laughs> When you like, if you're protesting being declined for stuff. So those are all things you got to think about uh, to get there. Cause, and a real person does look at this stuff. It's not all automated. Uh, I would think at some point they will automate this, but for whatever reason they don't. So it takes, if you mess up and simple things are forgotten, you got to wait another three to five days again and get approval or have a chance at approval. So it's definitely no joke. A couple other tips here. Uh, just try to make sure your sample utterances are as specific as possible. The more sample utterances, the better it will understand. Uh, use custom slots wherever possible if there isn't a slot type already for something you're trying to do as a parameter. Um, you always have to make sure Alexa responds to requests when prompted. They'll check for that. And if you don't um, respond to something when the user says something, like you could basically send back blank, right, on that intent coming back. They, if they see it do that, they're going to immediately reject you. So. Uh, and then again, be specific, guide users during the prompts, tell them what to say, and have a way for the repeat if they couldn't understand. Those are just the basic UI tips of making it a good experience for someone, right? It, you, people can't just guess what you want it to say. And you have to tell them. That's one of the basic things. Uh, in the cell, also, use misspellings and phonetics in your sample utterances a lot, and that will help Alexa understand people, um, especially if you have different kinds of accents and have different inflections, you can do that. All right, a couple gotchas, uh, number types for numbers. Uh, make sure you do that, otherwise you'll get like numbers coming back that are like O-N-E or whatever. So y there's an actual type you need for numbers. Uh, sometimes you can use a literal type to parse better. Very exceptions, they're trying to, they've been saying that was going away for a while, it's still there. And some invocation words don't work. You can't say hello, Amazon Echo, any of the reserved things. Uh, Grails doesn't work too good. It doesn't seem to interpret that very well. And again, the SSL self-signed certs only for dev mode, and the common name must match the host name of the app or it will give you a weird error that you'll spend hours trying to figure out why. And again, SSML audio, follow those tips, and all that. Uh, here's some sources for some more information. These are the links to all the sample code here. So I'll share these slides with everyone. And if you're trying to migrate something old that you made with a V1 API, I found this thing really helpful. It's not terribly complete. Docs aren't all that great on it yet. But um, you want to go here. 
and it will give you at least a, a clue as to how the new API works. It's all builder-based. The old stuff wasn't. All right. And special thanks to Graham Roche for helping fix the last issues that I had of this uh, this year, and my buddy Lee Fox helped me do this original talk for Grails, and Benoit, he helped uh, do the first groovy Lambda example I'd ever seen. So those are all foundations of the thing. All right, thanks a lot, everybody. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, hit me up. I know we're out of time, so I'll be out by the OCI table. You can ask me whatever, and I'll do my best. All right, thank you.